Hey there, Econ students. In this video, I'm going to go through every graph that AP macroeconomics students need to know for their exam. I went through the entire course and I discovered there's actually only nine graphs you need to know. And in this video, I'll walk you through each of those nine graphs. I'll show you how to draw it, how to label the axes, and how the graph can be used to show some important economic concepts. Now, if you like what you see in this video, I strongly encourage you to go buy my AP macro class notes. This is a 200 page set of notes written exactly for the AP macroeconomics course. It's the ultimate resource for studying for the AP macro exam. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel and head to econclassroom.com. I'm also going to put a link directly to those AP macro notes below this video. I hope you decide to buy them. I think you're going to find them extremely useful and help you prepare for that exam next month. Let's start with the production possibilities curve. The first thing we always do in a PPC graph is label the axes. You can either do two goods such as good A or good B or you could do two different types of goods like consumer goods and capital goods. For this one, we're going to draw a straight line PPC, which represents a constant opportunity cost PPC. Now, we could also draw a curved PPC, which is bowed out from the origin, which would indicate the two goods have increasing opportunity costs. The red dashed lines represent different possible levels of production in a country. Notice that as we move from one point to another on the PPC, there is an opportunity cost in terms of how much of the other good must be given up. Now, the orange dots, X, Y, and Z, represent potential levels of output. Now, if this is an individual's PPC, then point X represents an inefficient use of the individual's resources. Of course, if it's a country's PPC, point X represents a level of output at which resources are underutilized in the economy. Point Y represents full employment of resources, and point Z represents a level of production that is beyond what is currently possible but could be achieved through economic growth. Let's move on to our supply and demand diagram. We're going to start with the axes again. We're going to label the vertical axis price. This is the price per unit of a good. And the horizontal axis is quantity. That's how much is demanded and supplied. Let's draw a downward sloping demand curve showing the inverse relationship between a good's price and quantity demanded and the upward sloping supply curve showing the direct relationship between price and quantity supplied. Next, we always want to identify our equilibrium quantity. This is how much will be demanded in the market and the equilibrium price. When a market's in equilibrium, every unit that is produced is consumed. The quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. But what happens when there is a change in demand or supply? Let's look at one example. Assume demand for this good increases. Demand shifts out, causing a temporary shortage of the good because at the original equilibrium price, the quantity demanded now exceeds the quantity supplied. Therefore, a shortage is created. The equilibrium price will, in the long run, increase until a new equilibrium is restored at the intersection of the new demand curve and the supply curve. Now, there could be changes in demand or supplies that cause temporary disequilibriums in markets. You must know how to illustrate and explain how markets adjust to these changes over time. All right, for the next graph, we're going to move on to the business cycle. This is the first real macroeconomics graph you need to understand. In the business cycle graph, we've got real GDP on the vertical axis. That's how much output a country produces in a particular year. And we've got time, usually the number of years, on the horizontal axis. A typical business cycle will show increases in GDP over time, but there will be short-run fluctuations. A nation's business cycle demonstrates four phases. We've got expansion when the business cycle is increasing, output is increasing over time. Expansions end in peaks. This is when a country's economy stops growing and enters a recession. Recessions end with what we call troughs, and then they enter a recovery or another expansion phase of the business cycle. Notice, however, the dashed red line. This represents the long-run growth trend of the nation over time. Next, we're going to move on to the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. The vertical axis in the ADAS graph is not price, it is price level, representing the consumer price index or another way of measuring the average prices in a country. Horizontal label is real GDP. This is how much output an entire country produces. The downward sloping AD curve shows the inverse relationship between the price level of goods and how much of a country's output consumers demand. And the SRAS curve represents the short run increase in output that will result as price levels increase. LRAS, or long-run aggregate supply, represents the potential full employment level of output in the country. Hence, we use YFE for the full employment level of income and PFE for the full employment price level. Changes in AD or SRAS can cause changes in the equilibrium level of output. For example, a fall in aggregate demand would in the short run cause a decrease in real GDP to Y1 and a decrease in the price level to P1. This is known as a recession because output is now below the full employment level. If AD were to increase, we'd see an increase in an actual output beyond the full employment level, and we'd see demand pull inflation as prices rise to P2 and output rises to Y2. Whenever a country is producing below or above its full employment level, it has either a recessionary gap, as we've shown here, or an inflationary gap when a country is producing beyond full employment. 
Next, we're going to have a look at the bond market. The bond market is where private firms or governments can issue bonds in order to borrow money from lenders and pay them back sometime in the future. The price of a bond is on the vertical axis. The quantity of bonds issued, demanded, and supplied is on the horizontal axis. Demand for bonds is downward sloping because when the price is lower, investors want to buy more bonds since they'll earn a higher return or higher yield in the future. The equilibrium price of a bond is going to be lower than the face value of the bond because investors aren't going to lend governments or private firms money and get paid back the same amount of money in the future. The important thing to know about bonds is that the price of the bond is inversely related to the yield or the interest rate on that bond. When bond prices fall, for example, when more bonds are issued, the price of the bonds goes down, incentivizing more lenders to buy those bonds. As they do, they will enjoy a higher yield. Notice here that at $950 for a $1,000 bond, the real interest rate is around 5%, but when bond prices go down to $900, the investor who buys that bond earns around 11% return. So in conclusion, we're going to see that there is an inverse relationship between bond prices and bond yields. As the bond price falls, the interest rate on that bond goes up. As the bond price rises, the interest rate on that bond goes down. Let's move on to the money market next. In the money market, the nominal interest rate is determined. So the vertical axis will be labeled nominal interest rate. The horizontal axis will be labeled the quantity of money and demand for money is downward sloping because at lower interest rates, households demand more money for consumption and more money as an asset. The supply of money is vertical because it is set by the central bank through its monetary policy. The equilibrium nominal interest rate is where supply for money equals demand for money. The money market is where we show the effects of the central bank's monetary policy. If there's an increase in the money supply, it represents an expansionary monetary policy, such as the purchase of government bonds by the central bank. This lowers interest rates and increases the quantity of money demanded for investment and consumption. A decrease in money supply represents a contractionary monetary policy, such as the sale of government bonds by the central bank, increases interest rates, and reduces the amount of money demanded for consumption and investment. So the shift out of the money supply represents expansionary monetary policy. The shift in of the money supply represents contractionary monetary policy. Next, we're going to move on to the loanable funds market. This is where the demand for investment and the supply of savings in an economy determines the real interest rate, which is our vertical label, and the quantity of funds demanded for investment in an economy. So the downward sloping demand for investment curve represents the inverse relationship between real interest rates and how much investment happens in an economy, and the supply curve represents the direct relationship between the interest rate and how much savings happens in an economy. The equilibrium level of investment and the equilibrium interest rate is determined by the supply and the demand for for loanable funds. Now you most likely want to use the loanable funds graph to illustrate the effects of crowding out in the economy. Crowding out is when an increase in the government's deficit spending drives up the demand for loanable funds causing the equilibrium real interest rate to rise and a decrease in the quantity of private sector investment. So notice here that as demand for funds shifts out because the government is borrowing money from the private sector, the quantity of private investments labeled as Q private decreases in the economy. This is called crowding out and it reduces the effectiveness of expansionary fiscal policy. Policy. When a government deficit spends, it has to borrow from the public, driving up the demand for loanable funds or the investment demand in the economy. However, this crowds out private investment, meaning that the increase in aggregate demand will be smaller than what the government anticipated or expected it to be. The next graph we're going to look at is the Phillips curve. We're going to look at both the short run and the long run Phillips curve, both which compare the relationship between the inflation rate in the economy and the unemployment rate. Now I'm going to add a negative range to my vertical axis here because there is, of course, the possibility of deflation when inflation is negative. We have to be able to show the effect that that has on unemployment. The short run Phillips curve in blue represents the inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment in the short run. Notice that at higher inflation rates, such as 4%, we can expect there to be a lower unemployment rate. This is because there's more demand in the economy, therefore there's more demand for labor when inflation is high, meaning unemployment is low. As the inflation rate falls, the unemployment rate increases. If there's deflation in the economy, such as negative 2%, we can expect there to be a higher level of unemployment. In this case, we'd be at 8.5%. The long run Phillips curve is vertical because it shows that in the long run, when wages and prices are perfectly flexible, unemployment will always return to its natural rate which in this case is around 3.5%. The natural rate of unemployment is that which corresponds with the full employment level of output. So the vertical LRPC is basically a mirror image of the vertical LRAS. However, in the short run, when AD 
decreases, we can expect inflation to fall and unemployment to rise. And if AD increases, we expect inflation to increase and unemployment to decrease. For our final graph, we're going to look at the foreign exchange market. This is where exchange rates, or the prices of currencies, are determined. In this market, we're going to look at the price of dollars in terms of Mexican pesos. So we have to give our graph a label. That would be the exchange rate, or pesos per dollar. And we're going to look at the quantity of dollars demanded and supplied in Mexico. So we have to label our demand curve the demand for dollars. We must label our supply curve the supply of dollars. It's upward sloping because at higher exchange rates, our Americans are willing to supply more dollars to Mexico. The equilibrium quantity is where supply of dollars and demand for dollars intersect, and the equilibrium exchange rate is where they intersect. This is In this case, we have an exchange rate of 20 pesos per dollar. Now, what happens if the demand increases for dollars in Mexico because Mexicans, say, want to travel to the United States or want to buy more American goods? This will cause the exchange rate to rise, a new equilibrium exchange rate, and more dollars will be supplied in Mexico. This is known as an appreciation of a currency. That's when a currency gets stronger. Now, if the supply of a currency were to increase, let's say Americans demand more Mexican goods, therefore supply more dollars to Mexico, this will cause a depreciation of the currency as the exchange rate falls. You must know the terms appreciation and depreciation and must, and must be able to illustrate these two concepts in an exchange rate or a forex market diagram. Well, there you go, guys. Every graph you need to know for the AP macro exam in just over 10 minutes. If you like what you see here, I have a lot of other resources to help you prepare for that exam. Like I mentioned at the beginning, there's a great new AP macro set of class notes, 200 pages, including every graph, every concept explained exactly as it is presented in the AP course. You can also sign up for tutoring on my website. I'm putting a link to these resources below. Please subscribe to my channel and follow the link below so I can help you be prepared for your AP exam next month. Here we go.